Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to our daily Hindu analysis. Before we begin, we have an important announcement. Yesterday, UPSC has brought out the 2023 notification. So those who are appearing for this year's exam, please visit the UPSC website, download the notification, go through all the details and start applying for the examination. The last date to apply is 21st February. Now those who are preparing for this year and even those who are preparing for the next year, most of you would be worried as to how to crack this challenging exam in the very first attempt. Don't worry, we got you covered. This Saturday on the 4th of Feb, we have arranged a workshop exclusively on the Baiju's exam prep app. In this workshop, Sarbad sir will help you understand and he will be guiding you as to how to crack this challenging exam in the very first attempt. So do attend the workshop without fail and register by using the link provided in the description box below. With this, let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. And first, let's take a look at the topics we're going to cover today. Yesterday was budget day Union Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman has presented the union budget. So obviously today's newspaper is dominated by budget related articles. But I'm not going to go into the details of the budget because yesterday we had a special session on our YouTube channel. Yesterday we went live at 8 p.m. and we have covered all the key highlights and the important analysis regarding the budget. So today what we will do is I'm selectively picking three important editorials and columns that have appeared in the newspaper and we shall analyze the budget. We shall carry out a broad analysis of the budget which could be very very relevant for your mains and also for your prelims exam. We will not look at each and every specific sector details and schemes but will carry out a broad analysis by using this editorial on page number 10 and these two important columns on page 10 and 11. So we'll have a combined discussion of these articles and then we shall take a look at a column related to judicial majoritarianism on page number 12 and we shall also talk about an important development in India-US relations which has been reported on page number 18. So these are the important discussions we have lined up for today and all you have to do is support our initiatives by pressing the like button, by sharing your comments below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's start with the editorial on page number 10. This editorial is providing an interpretation of the union budget which was tabled yesterday in the parliament. See, union budget is a very complicated exercise. The task of drafting and executing the budget in itself is a very complex task. If drafting the budget is one complex exercise for the government, interpreting the budget for experts, analysts, for academicians, and for the common people in general, in itself is a great task. Because the budget document is very detailed. There are a lot of pages to go through, a lot of information to go through. It's not easy to come out with quick assessments. But based on what the government has provided us with, based on what information the government has provided us, we can carry out an initial assessment and estimate as to how good the budget is and evaluate the shortcomings of the budget. The editorial here takes a stand that the budget is indeed focusing on inclusive development, which is a positive point. The budget does have a lot of positives, but at the same time, it is giving an impression that the government seems to be favoring the rich, the affluent, as compared to the poor. This is the editorial stand. So based on this, let's carry out a very balanced discussion. Let's look at various provisions of the budget, what the finance minister has said, what the government has proposed. And based on this, let's bring out a balanced assessment of the union budget. While tabling the budget, finance minister Nirmala Sitaraman has said, India has registered an impressive growth of 7%, which is the highest amongst all the major economies. This is a positive point. It shows the success of the government of India as well in pulling back India's growth curve, which had been deeply hit by the pandemic. There are every indication available to show that the Indian economy is back on track. We are heading towards pre-pandemic growth levels. The government has also claimed credit for doubling the per capita income 
in the last nine years. Since the Modi government came to power since 2014, according to the government of India, the per capita income has more than doubled to 1.97 lakh rupees. And this is a clear indication of the widespread economic growth being witnessed in the Indian economy. No doubt India has become the world's fifth largest economy with improved standard of living. And this is what the government is telling us. The government has used this opportunity to come out with a comprehensive budget. Because don't forget, this is the last full budget of the Modi government. Because next year, the government would be headed towards elections. We are headed towards national election, elections in next year. So this would be the last full budget of the Modi government. So here the government has to balance electoral considerations along with fiscal responsibility because fiscal deficit had shot up very significantly due to the increased expenditure of the government during the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, because of the Russia-Ukraine war and the global economic situation, government's revenue has gone down and government's expenditure has increased significantly in the last two, three years. So fiscal deficit has shot up. So government has a very big responsibility to balance the fiscal deficit and bring back fiscal consolidation. At the same time, it has to keep in mind the electoral calculations for next year. It has to please the electorate. Plus, it has to provide for long-term growth and long-term stability to the Indian economy. So this is not an easy task. It's a very difficult balancing act. And to be fair, the government has done a decent job of striking this balance between populist schemes, fiscal consolidation, and capital expenditure and long-term growth. So all these objectives are being balanced by the government through this budget. And the government is calling it the Amrit Kals budget as India marks 75 years of independence. And as the government is branding this as India's entry into the Amrit Kal, to the golden period, the government has said that this budget is laying the path for India to become a developed nation by 2047. The budget is laying down an aspiration for in India. It is laying down a goal when India achieves 100 years of independence in 2047. The Modi government wishes India to emerge as a developed nation. So for this, the union budget is laying down a path and it identifies seven priority areas. The government is calling it the seven Sapta Rishis, which can guide India towards becoming a developed nation by the 100th year of independence. So please make a note of these seven priorities or the seven Sapta Rishis that the government has prioritized. According to the government of India, to transform India during this Amrit Kal, the seven focus areas have to be inclusive development, ensure every section of the Indian society is covered through the benefits of development. Reach out to the last mile, reach out to the nooks and corners of the country, reach out to every section of the Indian society, the tribal communities, women, farmers, the youth, Ensure that everyone gets the benefits of development equitably. Next is infrastructure and investment. Make long-term capital investments to create long-lasting assets in order to promote economic growth, to create jobs. And this requires modern infrastructure. So the government has prioritized infrastructure and investment. Next is unleashing the potential of India's key sectors like tourism, banking, finance, digital payments, etc. It is also focusing on sustainable growth, environment-friendly growth. So green growth is also one of the priorities. Next is to exploit the demographic dividend of India, to exploit the potential of India's youth, to create adequate jobs, give them the right education, the right skills, ensure their nutrition and health care so that India's youth can deliver in the coming decades and transform the country into a developed nation by 2047. And finally, the budget focuses on reforms to the financial sector as well, to carry out the necessary reforms, to bring in the required capital, which could be invested in key sectors. So these seven priority areas have been identified and the government is calling it the seven Sapta Rishis. Now, if you go deeper into the budget, if you look at the various allocations that have been made, we can actually conclude that the government has indeed prioritized inclusive development. It has tried to do justice to various sections of the Indian society to ensure that India's growth is equitable and inclusive. There are some provisions and schemes and missions 
for every key section of the Indian society, especially to the weaker sections, to the vulnerable sections. Be it the farmers, the youth, women, the other backward classes, scheduled castes, scheduled tribes. For all these focus sections or focus groups, there is something or the other in the budget. Now let me just take you through some of these important provisions which could help you in your prelims and also in your mains. We'll go from one sector to another just to see how inclusive the budget is. How the government is trying to provide equitable growth and development to different sections of the Indian society and to different sectors of the Indian economy. If you look at the agriculture sector, the government has committed 186 lakh crore rupees to ensure that in the agriculture sector, enough credit is available to provide loans to farmers. This is mainly to take farmers away from the debt trap of money lenders and informal lending and push the agriculture sector towards formal banking and formal lending. The government has proposed the establishment of an agriculture accelerator fund to incentivize and promote agri startups in rural areas, to promote innovation and to fuse technology with agriculture, particularly in the rural belt. It has proposed Atmanirbhar Bharat Horticulture Clean Plant Program to boost the productivity of horticulture crops, especially high value horticulture crops such as important fruits and vegetables. These cash crops will bring in additional income, additional revenue to the farmers. This fulfills the government's goal of doubling farmers income as well. The government has promised 20 lakh crore credit for the animal husbandry sector which covers dairy sector and fisheries as well. Again, the idea here is to create alternate income for the farmers. Ensure that farmers are not just dependent on farming, but they also have alternate sources of income through the animal husbandry sector. The budget is proposing additional storage capacity for farm produce to improve farm logistics, to provide for better warehousing, better cold storage facilities, and ensure that we reduce the wastage and increase the shelf life of our agri products. This directly translates to economic benefits to farmers and improves the overall logistical efficiency of India's food processing industry. And finally, the government is prioritizing nutritional crops such as millets through the Sri Anna scheme to transform India into a global hub for nutritional crops such as millets. So these initiatives proposed in the budget, they clearly show that the government is indeed paying adequate attention to the agriculture sector to ensure the well-being of the farmers. You can see a similar approach in the healthcare sector as well. You see that inclusive approach being taken in the healthcare sector also. The government expenditure has been enhanced to 2.1% of the GDP for the coming financial year. Healthcare expenditure is being increased because the pandemic has taught us valuable lessons. It's very important to strengthen our public healthcare institutions. Public healthcare system has to be the backbone of any country's healthcare system. In India, healthcare system is largely dominated by the private sector and as a result, for the common man, out-of-pocket expenditure is very, very high. In the public healthcare sector, you're not receiving quality healthcare and it has always been a plaguing issue. So to plug this, the government is looking to increase healthcare expenditure, but it's a nominal increase. It's not a very significant jump. It's a very nominal increase and it's being enhanced to 2.1% of the GDP. The government is launching a mission to eliminate sickle cell anemia, which primarily affects women, young children. So a mission is being launched to eliminate sickle cell anemia. There is focus on creating more nursing colleges, establishing research labs to improve diagnostics and research, and also to promote a dedicated research program in pharmaceuticals to consolidate India's position as the pharmacy of the world. India has, has established its position as a pharmacy of the world by producing the world's largest volume of generic drugs and vaccines. We want to cement this position and consolidate this and India is setting up a dedicated research program in the pharmaceutical sector. So these are laudable initiatives but again the overall expenditure is still not sufficient to strengthen our public healthcare institutions. This means we will continue relying on private healthcare, our out-of-pocket expenditure will remain high, but 
there are some indications that the government is looking to increase public health care spending. So this is another inclusive feature of the budget. Next, another key sector is education. In education sector as well, historically, India's spending in education also has been very low. These are two sectors, education and healthcare. These are two sectors where our budgetary spending has been very low compared to other similar countries. But the government has enhanced the education budget to around 2.9% of the GDP for the next financial year. Again, this is a very marginal increase. It's still not sufficient to meet India's learning gaps. But nevertheless, it's a small and minor improvement. It's an approach towards more inclusive growth. The budget is also focusing on teacher training. It proposes to set up a national digital library focused on children and adolescents. It is encouraging states to set up more libraries at panchayat levels and local ward levels. And more importantly, the government is launching the fourth edition of the Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana to provide skill development training to lakhs of youth in the country. The youth who are largely unemployed due to the lack of adequate skills are being provided with vocational training and skill development under the ambitious Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana. The fourth edition of this is being launched. It's being funded through the budget to ensure that India's youth acquire the right skills and they are prepared for the job market. It helps in creating more jobs as well. Next, the budget is identifying four transformative opportunities. Four important areas are being identified and one of them deals with women empowerment. So this shows the budget is inclusive. It is prioritizing women issues and women empowerment. The government wants to promote self-help groups under the National Rural Livelihood Mission and transform the small women-led enterprises into large producer enterprises. Under the Deen Dayal National Rural Livelihood Mission, the government has been supporting women-led self-help groups to, to become self-made entrepreneurs by launching their own product-based enterprises, especially in the rural areas. The government gives loans, technical help, training, etc. to transform these self-help groups into self-sustaining private enterprises. So now the government wants to enable around 81 lakh self-help groups in the country to become large producer enterprises, to make them into large enterprises which can sustain the livelihood of millions of women in the country. Next, the government has proposed a new initiative. Please make a note of this. Very important for your prelims. The government is launching PM Vikas or Pradhan Mantri Vishwakarma Kaushal Samman, which would be a dedicated program to support and train the traditional artisans of the country. The craftsmen and artisans who play a vital role in our rural economy, in our cottage industry based economy, they are being supported financially through this scheme. They'll be provided skill training as well. And this important scheme is being launched to ensure the well-being of craftsmen and artisans. The budget also proposes the establishment of unity malls in each district through which local produce, GI based or geographical indication based produce and local products produced by local artisans can be sold and promoted and marketed in order to help the artisans sustain their livelihood and create new opportunities for them. So these are some important announcements to transform the lives of craftsmen and artisans. So again, it shows the inclusive features of the budget. Next, the government is looking to tap the potential of tourism, both domestic and international tourism, because this has great potential to create jobs across India. The budget is also focusing on green growth, usage of cleaner technologies, more renewable, efficient technologies, to not just reduce emissions and tackle pollution, but also to create new sectors and open up new jobs in the green market. So these are a few transformative opportunities that the budget has identified. The budget also focuses on social inclusion. It focuses on ensuring social justice to all sections of the Indian society. It is looking to launch a very, very important mission, the Pradhan Mantri PVTG Development Mission. PVTG stands for Particularly Vulnerable Tribal Groups. These are the most vulnerable tribal groups in our country. 
who are recognized through government policy and they receive special protection, special benefits from the government. So to ensure the well-being and the welfare of the particularly vulnerable tribal groups, a dedicated development mission is being launched. The government is also providing financial assistance to drought hit areas, especially in Karnataka, in interior Karnataka, to carry out micro irrigation projects. Again, you can see the intent, the clear intent to provide for social inclusion by covering every corner of the country and by covering every section of the Indian society. There is focus on teacher training, Ekalavya model residential schools to improve education across the country, to provide for food security to the weakest sections of the society. The Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana, which is a very ambitious free food grain scheme. This scheme has been extended for one more year. This vital ambitious scheme was launched during the pandemic. When the pandemic and the lockdowns destroyed the lives of migrant workers and the poor in the country, the Modi government launched this ambitious Antyodaya Anna Yojana to provide food security for, for the poor population. This scheme has continued ever since the pandemic broke out and now the government is extending this free food grain facility for one more year. This involves a significant expenditure in terms of food subsidy. But it's a very essential component to ensure food security in the country, which again shows the social features of the budget. The government is proposing Bharat Shri initiative to digitize ancient inscriptions of India to protect and conserve India's civilizational and cultural heritage. And there is also a dedicated outlay for housing, especially for the poor. And the allocation for Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana is being increased by 66%. So these features clearly highlight the approach of the budget to reach out to the last mile to ensure that no one is left behind and provide for inclusive growth and development. So these features are definitely visible. And when it comes to income taxes, personal income taxes as well, the government has made an attempt to provide relief to the salaried class, the middle class and the pensioners. The ta taxation structure has been rationalized. I'm sure many of you would have already heard about it. This is likely to benefit few sections of the salaried class, the middle class, which is hardworking class. And also the pensioners, the retired pensioners. So to provide some relief to them, the tax structure has been rationalized and reformed. And under the new taxation regime, those who earn up to 7 lakh rupees are being exempted from income tax. Along with this, few other minor benefits are being provided. And the government is claiming that this will benefit the taxpayers, the, especially from the middle class and the salaried class. The tax lab also has been reformed with exemption limit being increased. So this is expected to provide some relief to the income taxpayers. But critics, however, argue that these changes being made in personal income taxes will not really benefit a large section of the taxpayers. It will benefit a very, very small section of the salaried class and the middle class. It is unlikely to help most of the taxpayers. The criticism here is that the budget seems to have a bias towards the rich and the affluent. Because if you look at the overall tax reduction the government has provided, there is a bias towards high net worth individuals, towards the highest income bracket, those who earn the highest level of income in the country and those who pay the highest taxes. There is a greater bias the government has shown because effectively the tax cut amounts to 3.74 percentage points to high net worth individuals. This is a very significant cut for the rich and the affluent. The same cut is not being provided to the poor and the middle class. The tax rationalization that you saw, it will benefit very few people in the salaried class and the middle class, whereas most of the high net worth individuals will benefit because of this drastic reduction in effective ta tax rate. So this is one criticism against the budget. It shows the government is biased more towards the affluent and the rich, while it doesn't pay the same attention towards the poor and the middle class. Next, one appreciable feature of the budget is that it is providing a lot of priority for infrastructure and capital investment. The government has made it clear that it is going to focus on growth, job creation and employment opportunities. This will not happen without adequate infrastructure creation, without adequate capital investments. So the budget is providing for 
an increase in capital investment by a massive 33.4 percent this is the highlight the key point of the budget the capital expenditure on long-term capital projects is being increased by 33.4 percent to 10 lakh crore rupees along with this the infrastructure finance secretariat will assist the stakeholders to enable more private investment in key infrastructure sectors urban infrastructure and urban transformation especially in smaller cities in tier 2 tier 3 cities is also being prioritized by establishing the urban infrastructure development fund and the center will continue providing 50 year interest free loan to state governments to enable them to make more capital investments to invest in asset creation projects to create long lasting long term assets like roads bridges schools hospitals etc which will provide for long term benefit for the economy it will help build a build the domestic economy and it will create long lasting assets which will benefit various sections of the indian society and the indian economy so this is one significant aspect of the of the budget so if you look at infrastructure specifically there is a lot of focus on providing that last mile connectivity generally governments focus on mega projects critical infrastructure projects like large airports large highways mega railway projects large seaport projects while these big projects are important it's also equally important to focus on the smaller projects to provide that last mile connectivity so the budget is trying to do that an expert committee is being constituted to review the harmonized master list of infrastructure to take a look at all the major infrastructure projects in the country and just for the railways a capital budget of 2.4 lakh crore rupees has been assigned which is a very significant which is a very significant allocation along with that 100 critical transport projects have been identified which will be prioritized in the coming fiscal year these projects cover roadways railways inland waterways etc even power transmission so these 100 critical projects especially the transport infrastructure projects would be a top priority for the government to provide for that last mile connectivity around 50 additional airports small airports in smaller towns heliports water aerodromes and advanced landing grounds are being created this will not only boost connectivity and boost economic growth it will also help boost our security in the border areas because it will provide for faster deployment of our troops to enhance border security so keeping both the objectives in mind such last mile connectivity projects are being prioritized and coastal shipping is also being brought under focus through the public partnership mode through the public private partnership mode so different forms of transportation connectivity and infrastructure is being prioritized under this year's budget the budget balances this with the objective of sustainable balanced growth in order to ensure we remain committed to our climate action goals under paris agreement to keep our emissions lower and transition to cleaner renewable energy and to tackle pollution green growth is being prioritized and the government is launching a green credit program to incentivize any sustainable action then important environment related initiatives are being launched and please make a note of this it's very important for your prelims pm prana which stands for program for restoration awareness nourishment and amelioration of mother nature or mother earth this important program is being launched to protect the soil and the nature from the adverse impact of chemical fertilizers and pesticides it is promoting alternate fertilizers more organic fertilizers which do not harm the nature our soil system our water system etc so this important scheme pm pranam scheme is being launched to nourish and ameliorate mother earth and protect all forms of ecosystems soil terrestrial water etc from the adverse impact of fertilizers and pesticides the government is promoting the govardhan scheme again to promote natural organic based farming to promote organic fertilizers and to conserve mangroves which play a vital role in coastal economy which also play a role in disaster management in mitigating the impact of tsunamis and cyclones to protect these critical wetlands and ecosystems mishti program is being launched 
which stands for Mangrove Initiative for Shoreline Habitats and Tangible Incomes. Mangrove forests that line India's coastline, they play a vital role in cutting the impact, in reducing the impact of cyclones and tsunamis. They save lives, they protect ecosystems. Plus, they are vital for the coastal economy. Mangrove resources, they are vital for the coastal income of the coastal community and the fishing communities. So, Mishti scheme is being launched to protect the mangrove plantation along India's coastline and Amrit Daroha scheme is being implemented over the next three years for optimal usage of our wetland ecosystems. So, these are important environment-related initiatives which shows that the budget is focused on green growth and it is looking to prioritize sustainable growth as well. So the mantra is inclusive growth and sustainable growth. This has been the mantra India has been following since the last 20 years. Since the last two decades, subsequent Indian governments have followed this mantra of inclusive and sustainable development. So this is clearly getting reflected in the budget. The finance minister has said the government has succeeded in formalizing the economy. More formal jobs are being created today. And the government has said that this is the success of the Modi government. There has been a big transformation the government has achieved, especially in the introduction of digital technologies, particularly in financial sector with regard to digital payments. This is no doubt a big su success for the Modi government because India indeed is a leading power today in digital payments. There is probably no other country which has achieved this high degree of adoption of digital payments. This is not a mean achievement, it's a very, very big achievement which helps in formalizing the economy and it helps in bringing more accountability into the system. The government is clearly recognizing that if India has to become a developed nation by the 100th year of independence, then we need to bring in more technology. We need to create a knowledge-based economy. So this requires focus on education, higher education, research and development, innovation and reforms in the finance sector, in the financial sector with greater public investments, that is greater government investments. So government is clearly recognizing this approach and it has outlined the agenda to create jobs to promote growth in the economy in the coming decades. This is another positive aspect about the budget that it is getting the priorities right. It is laying out the right vision to lead India towards becoming a developed nation by 2047. However, there are quite a few shortcomings as well. Of course, no budget is perfect. And along with all the positives we discussed, there are many shortcomings which the critics are pointing out. One of the biggest criticism is the reduction in allocation for Manrega scheme. The Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme was a flagship program launched by the then UPA government headed by former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. This scheme provided 100 legally guaranteed days of manual work in rural areas which became an important source of alternate livelihood for the rural sector, especially for farmers and others involved in the agriculture sector. The Manrega scheme became a lifeline. It would give them additional income, guaranteed 100 days of work, and it would place additional money in their hands, which was boosting rural spending as well. It was single-handedly responsible for boosting rural growth in India in the last 20 years. So Manrega scheme is a very ambitious scheme in that regard. But the concern is the government has cut its budget by 33%. It's a massive cut. It's been cut down to just 60,000 crore rupees. This is where critics are pointing out that there is a confusion in the budget. The government is saying schemes like Mishti, which is focused on mangrove conservation, mangrove protection. The government says this mangrove conservation scheme will be funded through a convergence between Manrega and compensatory afforestation fund. The government is saying to implement Mishti scheme to protect our mangrove plantation, the funds will come from Manrega and Compensatory Afforestation Fund. If that is the case, then why is the government cutting the budget of Manrega? There is a drastic cut which is happening. So if the budget of Manrega itself is being reduced, how will the new schemes be funded? There is no clarity on this. The government has not explained as to how these other initiatives will be funded. This is a serious concern for the rural economy, especially at a time when the pandemic has hit the rural economy income. The pandemic has taken a very big hit on rural income. Migrant workers, many of them have gone back. Farmers are still struggling from the impact and there is high inflation. There is high inflation in our 
rural economy. I'm so sorry for the technical issue. Yeah, if you look at the rural economy, the inflation remains high. The burden on the rural population is still very high and people are dependent on Manrega for their additional income. So cutting down the budget of such an important scheme is, is being heavily criticized as it affects the objective of rural development and inclusive development. The other shortcoming is the budgetary allocation for rural development itself. There is no big jump in allocation for rural development. In fact, there is a marginal increase of 0.1%, which is very nominal. It's not even a significant jump. Compared to previous budget estimate, there is just a 0.1% increase in budgetary allocation for rural development. If you actually compare the proposed uh, estimate with the revised estimate of last fiscal, it is actually a reduction of 0.6%. If you compare it with the revised estimate, there is a reduction in allocation for rural development. So this is not a good sign. It's not a good sign, especially when the rural sector is already struggling due to poor rainfall, problems in agriculture, impact of pandemic. Keeping these factors in mind, the government should have increased spending on rural development, but it has done the opposite. Next is food subsidy. In food subsidy, there is a sharp reduction, a 5% decline compared to the last year's estimate and if you take the revised estimate of last fiscal there is a 31 percent reduction this is raising concerns about food security especially to the poor and the weaker sections but however to be fair you have to take into account the pandemic spending the government carried out because of the pandemic the government launched special food security schemes like the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana the Antyodhya Anna Yojana these schemes have incurred a lot of expenditure for the government in the last two, three years. So now the government is just toning it down, bringing it back to normal levels as the pandemic is subsiding. So if you account that, then the food subsidy reduction is fair enough. It helps the government consolidate the fiscal balance. But one should hope that it does not affect the food security goal and it does not affect the nutritional security which we offer to the poor sections of the Indian society. So that is one concern which has been brought up. But the biggest star in the budget, the biggest highlight, the standout point in this budget is the capital expenditure. You can see a considerable increase in the capital expenditure the government is making. There is a 33% jump as I pointed out compared to last year's budget estimate. The government has allocated 10 lakh crore rupees for capital expenditure, which will provide for capital investments. These are long term investments. It will help create long lasting assets, which will really boost our domestic economy. Along with this, states are provided with grant in aid of 3.7 lakh crores. So if you combine the two, capital expenditure comes up to 13.7 lakh crore rupees, which is a very, very significant spend. This is in line with what the economic survey has pointed out. Just before the budget economic survey was brought out, the economic survey pointed out that the global economy is not in the right shape. The pandemic, the Russia-Ukraine war, high inflation and global recession has created a lot of risk factors for the Indian economy. So we can't expect any external support for India's growth. From outside India, there may not be a big push for our growth and development. Whatever growth comes has to be domestic. It has to be internal. And in this regard, the government has done the right thing by boosting capital expenditure. If capital expenditure goes up in the next fiscal and in the coming years, it will help sustain domestic demand and create domestic opportunities for growth. It will help insulate the Indian economy from the impact of the external shocks. And this is a right step the government has taken. Is that clear? So that is why this is the standout feature of the union budget. And this opinion is being expressed by important writers through their columns as well. If you look at this column written by M. Govindara, who was, the mem who was one of the members of the 14th Finance Commission, he says that this budget signals growth and stability. The government has done its best possible, its best possible maneuvers. It has taken the best possible decisions to ensure that there is a balance between fiscal responsibility and growth and stability. It's not easy to strike this balance because the fiscal deficit 
was targeted at 6.4 percent for this year which is way beyond the target given under the FRBM Act, the Fiscal Responsibility Budget Management Act. This is understandable because the government had to shoot the fiscal deficit for the last two, three years because expenditure was very high during the pandemic because of the lockdowns. Revenue had fallen. So fiscal deficit had to go above the permitted limits. And now is the time to consolidate that and bring back that fiscal deficit. So various subsidies are being toned down. Food subsidy, fertilizer subsidies are being brought down. Capital expenditure for the long term is being provided so that it creates growth opportunities in the long run. So based on this, the writer says, the, for, the member of the 14th Finance Commission says that this is a balanced budget which is prioritizing growth and stability while aiming for fiscal consolidation. A similar argument is being made by Suresh Babu who is an advisor to the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. He is one of the top advisors to the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. He is also of the opinion that the government has done a good job of striking a balance between capital expenditure and fiscal responsibility. It has struck that fine balance while keeping in mind the electoral considerations of the next elections. So this is what you need to know about the union budget that was presented yesterday. I have tried covering all the key points with a summary and an analysis so that you will be in a position to answer any mains question or any relevant prelims question as well. But for a more detailed analysis, for more insight into the highlights of the budget, go and watch yesterday's session which is available on our YouTube channel. Now moving on, we shall take a look at this column from page number 12 which examines the validity of judicial majoritarianism. It brings up an important topic from polity called judicial majoritarianism. So first let's understand what exactly is judicial majoritarianism and why is this topic in news? See, when cases are filed at the Supreme Court, regular cases are taken up by divisional benches which usually includes two judges of the Supreme Court. Here usually decisions are made by consensus. Judgments are passed by consensus between the two judges. But if cases involving serious ramifications come up, especially if cases having an impact on constitutional interpretation, cases having a constitutional ramification. If such high priority cases come up, then something called constitutional benches are constituted. This is as per the provisions of Article 145, Clause 3 of the Indian Constitution. Under Article 145, Clause 3, constitution benches can be set up by the Supreme Court to look into cases involving constitutional ramifications. These constitutional benches, they could be made up of five judges or seven or nine or eleven, it can even go up to thirteen. You would have read in newspapers that a five judge constitution bench passed this judgment. A nine judge constitution bench has passed this judgment. So such a wide membership is given in a constitution bench, a lot of judges are brought in to ensure that more judicial minds are involved while deciding on important questions involving constitutional interpretation. So here decisions are taken by majority because all the judges may not have the same opinion. Right? Some of them might take a particular stand, other judges might oppose it and provide a dissenting judgment. So under the same article, Article 145, Clause 5, it has been provided that in case of constitution benches, judgment will be based on majority. Whatever majority judges say, that would be the final judgment. But however, minority judgment shall be recorded. The dissent provided by few judges can be recorded. Dissent is allowed. Some judges can dissent with the majority judgment. But the final ruling will be in line with the majority judgment. So this way of judicial pronouncements based on majoritarian decision making is judicial majoritarianism. Now this is under question because recently there was a petition against demonetization. The demonetization move of the government was challenged. The Supreme Court upheld the constitutional validity of demonetization. Because the majority judges agreed that demonetization was constitutionally valid and they struck down the petition. But in the minority judgment, there was a dissenting judge, Justice J. Nagaratna. 
her judgment was widely appreciated for criticizing the role of the RBI in not questioning the demonetization move of the central government as RBI is the monetary authority. This judgment was seen as a vital observation from a dissenting judge. But unfortunately, it has no legal validity because what prevails is majoritarian ruling. Majoritarian judicial ruling is what prevails. The minority dissent is only recorded, but it has no validity beyond that. So this is why the writer here is questioning that can we accept majoritarian judicial decision making in a democracy? Are there any shortcomings here? Are there any flaws involved? This is what the writer is questioning. See, in our legislature, in our parliament, for example, where our elected leaders make biased judgments and decisions based on popular perception, this is understandable because the elected representatives, that is your MPs, MLAs, they have come through popular vote. They have an obligation to please their electorate. So they are guided by popular perception. So they are allowed to have their biases and make decisions based on hunches. This is tolerable in the legislature, but not in the judiciary. Because in the judiciary, you have judges who are experts, who are expected to be subjective, who are expected to be neutral, unbiased, and pass objective judgments. They have to keep away their subjective experiences, prejudices, biases, etc. Keep away all their affiliations, stay neutral and, and unbiased and pass objective, neutral judgments. But if judges are also being guided by other influences, by public pressure, by media pressure, and if majority judgment is agreeing with this, then is this the right way? Is this the right path? Should we provide any validity for minority judgment? Should we give more validity and recognition for the dissent provided by the minority judges? That is the question the writer is bringing up. Because at the end of the day, judges are humans as well. They are bound to be influenced by various biases and prejudices. They might pass rulings based on hunches and popular perception, which might lead to erosion of justice, miscarriage of justice. In fact, in our rich constitutional history, there are many cases where historic minority judgments have been passed. For example, in the ADM Jabalpur case of 1976, Justice H.R. Kanna had upheld the right to life and personal liberty even when emergency conditions are implemented, even when a national emergency is in operation. Even then, right to life and liberty under Article 21 cannot be taken away. This was a vital interpretation given by the minority judgment in the ADM Jabalpur case. This later became the constitutional interpretation of Article 21. This laid the basis for that. Another important judgment is in the Justice Subarao case in the Karak Singh versus State of UP. Justice Subarao in 1962 had held right to privacy should be a fundamental right. This was in 1962. But despite this minority judgment, Right to privacy never became a fundamental right until 2017 when the Supreme Court declared right to privacy as a fundamental right in the K.S. Puttaswamy case. In K.S. Puttaswamy case in 2017, majority judgment agreed that right to privacy should be a fundamental right. But this minority ruling had actually been passed in 1962 itself by Justice Subarao in the Karak Singh case. So if some validity is given to minority judgment, especially in such rulings, then for these many years, right to privacy would have already been a fundamental right. That is the argument the writer is making. In some cases, there might be vital judicial observations made by the dissenting judges and it should be given some priority according to the writer. Because judicial decision making according to the writer cannot be driven just by majoritarian decision making. Because there are studies to show that judges are also getting influenced by external pressures. A recent study conducted in 2016 has shown that during the emergency period under the then Indira Gandhi government, just 1.27% of the judges were providing dissenting opinion. This number jumped exponentially to 10.52% in 1980 after the emergency was lifted. This is a possible indication that when emergency was in operation, judges were scared to go against the government. They were not dissenting and they were all passing majority judge, judgments. A same trend is seen when Chief Justice of India is part of a judicial bench. 
let's say there is a constitutional bench which includes the chief justice himself who is the top judicial officer the other judges of the supreme court hesitate to dissent when chief justice of india is part of the bench this is as per a study based on various rulings the study has shown when benches involve the chief justice himself or herself other judges are hesitant to dissent or provide a dissenting opinion so it shows that they are getting influenced by external pressures and subjective biases and opinions that is why majoritarian judicial decision making is questioned in a democracy not just in india around the world this topic is questioned and there is a debate there is a push being given for minority judgment to be recognized as well at least in cases involving serious constitutional implications so that is why this topic is very important now coming to the last article from page number 18 this topic deals with india us relations and it is related to a topic we covered yesterday if you have attended yesterday's session i spoke about the icet dialogue between india and us the initiative for critical and emerging technologies dialogue this dialogue was established in 2022 during the quad summit between india and us under this initiative india us are collaborating in the field of critical emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence 5g communication networks internet of things etc all these are advanced form of technologies which are driving the current stage of industrial revolution so india us are collaborating in this field of critical and emerging technology and they have launched this dialogue and the first dialogue was held on tuesday couple of days ago india's national security advisor ajit doval along with other top officials from india met with their counterpart met with the national security advisor of the us because this important dialogue is being driven by the national security council of both the countries the national security council of india and the us are driving this initiative and it is being led by the respective nsas they are bringing together various government scientific and research institutions including the likes of drdo isro and the others they are bringing together private companies industries research and development centers and the academia that is universities research centers as well so all these stakeholders are coming together between these two countries to collaborate in the field of critical emerging technologies important government research institutions private companies startups then research and development centers universities and academia all of them are coming together under the respective national security councils and the two countries are collaborating the objective is to promote co-production co-development in critical technologies particularly in key sectors like defense outer space communication etc the end objective is to share technology to provide for transfer of technology and to promote co-production and co-development because this is one area where india us are very close to each other so this dialogue has taken place as we discussed yesterday as well and the outcomes of the dialogue has come out in the public domain that is why the topic is important and we are discussing it again the specific details that were discussed has been brought out by the two countries both sides have identified six areas of planned cooperation please make a note of this they have identified six key areas of planned cooperation that involve strengthening innovation ecosystems to promote innovation in both countries specifically focus on defense innovation and technology cooperation to create resiliency in semiconductor supply chains which is mainly to end dependency on china dominated semiconductor supply chains focus on outer space technologies as well which are leading to critical emerging technologies focus on stem talent that is science technology engineering and mathematics ensure that both countries have the right manpower this initiative begins at the school level right from school to college you have to promote the stem field of disciplines science technology engineering and mathematics both india us are collaborating to create the required manpower in the coming decades and they are focusing on next generation telecommunication networks including 5g and 6g networks so these are the six important areas of cooperation that they have identified please make a note of this 
So in these areas, India, US will collaborate. Their respective scientific institutions will come together. For example, the National Science Foundation of the US, which is a leading US research agency, will collaborate with Indian scientific institutions like DRDO, Indian Institute of Science, ISRO and various other scientific organizations of India. So American and Indian scientific institutions will start collaborating in these key technologies. Quantum computing has been identified as a critical sector. Quantum computing could transform the world of computing. So both India and US are carrying out some leading research in this domain. They want to collaborate in this area. They are focusing on defense industrial cooperation to share critical defense technologies. They are focusing on strengthening India's semiconductor supply chain. The US already has the required technical knowledge, the skills and the resources. But India is lagging behind when it comes to semiconductors. We have a lot of import dependency here. So both sides are looking to move away from their China dependency when it comes to semiconductors and electronics. And they want to create a resilient supply chain between the two countries. And finally, they are also focusing on outer space cooperation including American support to India's human space flight program. Because India is planning the ambitious Gaganyaan mission, which would be our first human space flight program. The US is also looking to make an entry back into human space flight program. So this aligns with the vision of NASA and ISRO and the space sector of India and US. So outer space cooperation in critical technologies, especially with regard to human space flight, has been identified as a focus area. The two sides have prioritized cooperation in, in advanced forms of communication networks like 5G, 6G communication networks and open radio access network. These are advanced communication networks which are coming up, which will transform the mobile and internet landscape. US already has the required technology, India is lagging behind. So India will get the required assistance from US, both will collaborate to roll out 5G, 6G networks in India as well. Next. India is desperately looking for aircraft engines, fighter jet engines to power the Tejas aircraft. India's LCA program has run into a lot of problems, but this is all set to become the backbone of the Indian Air Force. So India is desperately looking for fighter jet engines from General Electric to solve the jet engine problems of the LCA Tejas. This request was pending. And the US government has said it will take a look at the application of General Electric, which is an American company, an American jet engine manufacturer. And if US government approves the deal, GE will be able to sell advanced fighter jet engines to India and HAL will install them to power the LCA Tejas fighter jets. Upon this, India has requested US to ease export controls and restrictions. Because when it comes to high-end technology, sensitive critical technologies, developed nations like US will have export controls and export restrictions. They will not easily transfer technology to other countries like India. So there are still some barriers, trade barriers that exist. So US has agreed to look into these control restrictions, export control restrictions and to bring them down. So high-end technologies like high-performance computing, supercomputing, source code of critical softwares can be transferred to India. So these important announcements have been made and this is what makes the ICT dialogue very, very important as far as the India-America partnership is concerned. India-US are going forward in every domain, in defense, in counter-terrorism, economic investments and technology is one key area and especially critical emerging technology is a critical area for both of them. That is why the topic is very, very important. On this note, I would like to conclude my discussion for today. I hope it was a comprehensive, elaborate discussion. I hope it was fruitful. Please take these two questions for your answer writing practice. Go through the question, write your answers, post your answers in the answer writing portal for which the link has been given in the description below. Don't forget, as soon as the session ends, we have a quiz on our Telegram channel. Subscribe to our Telegram channel using the link in the description. Take these questions so that you can prepare comprehensively for the upcoming prelims. So I hope you benefited from the session. Do let me know how it went. Comment below, like the video and without fail, subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.